welcome to the nonprofit conference. This is panel two uh, on uh, basically on worker co-ops and on platform co-ops. And uh, I'm Justin, I'm your host, moderator, and kind of overall curator of all the interesting speakers and ideas that I wanted to introduce to the, uh, the nonprofit sector here. And the kind of central inquiry here in my mind is, you know, can worker-owned cooperatives and platform cooperatives become a vehicle for social mobility or economic inclusion? And um, so uh, we have Associate Professor Trevor Schultz here, and basically he invented the term, right? Without, without him, there is no kind of conceptualization of the platform co-ops. And of course, we have, we have Kate Kathip, who herself is a worker owner in Great Emma's uh, Co uh, worker-owned cooperative in Baltimore that we're hoping also to visit. And she's also uh, co-founded um, Seed Commons, which funds such co-ops. And we have uh, uh, Mr. Tung Ah Yam himself, uh, chairman of the Singapore National Cooperative Federation, and together with Jovian Ko, uh, also from SNCF, who will be discussing, you know, you'll hear these interesting new ideas and solutions, and they will kind of weigh in on uh, its relevance and feasibility and value in the Singapore context. And we also have Dr. Hong Renyi, who is from the Department of Communications and New Media. And he um, he recently wrote this uh, book called Passionate Work. I just realized as we're Googling him. And it's about the notion of how uh, sometimes we talk about being passionate in the work to justify very terrible working conditions. And so I'm thinking about the social workers in the room, you know, <laughs> maybe you've forgone the very lucrative career for social work and you know, uh, are you being so strong? But more directly relevant is that he's done a recent uh, research on people with disabilities who work uh, as delivery riders in, in a, a cooperative, uh, uh, delivery riders for in Singapore. So I wanted to start by just kind of sharing an anecdote. We, my own kind of um, approach to this is that I have a domestic helper, a cleaner come to my house uh, once every week, right? So I'm lazy, I don't want to clean the house, right? So I exploit low-wage workers. So we pay $25 for this part-time help and then thinking, well, of course, you know, the company is going to take at least half of that, right? And then my wife asked uh, her how much she earned and out of the $25, she takes $6. And so the immediate instinct is, no, you know, we got, why don't we just have this arrangement with you bypass the, <laughs> bypass the greedy capitalist, right? And, you know, you can, we are happy to pay you a lot more than that. But of course, the labor is owned by the company and, you know, for whatever reasons, good or bad, you know, there might be insurance or lodging or whatever. Um, and, and so, but at some point, you know, there's, there's an amount that, uh, there's an amount that you feel, uh, uh, violates your sense of fairness. Um, should it be ten dollars? Should it be six dollars? At some point, you you feel outraged by it. So, so <laughs> and so this brings me to whether you know what if she had owned the company together with other cleaners, they are they are doing the work, right? What happened then? Um, and I also uh, have a different friend. So this is from the other end of the spectrum, the business owner. He's uh. Uh, and I actually approached him. So he's quite a successful businessman and he owns a series of uh, massage spas. And so I asked him if he would participate in a policy experiment, right? Why not take one of his branches and kind of transit or transit into a worker-owned co-op and then see after a year or two, you know, if the workers make their own decisions or wage structure and everything, what, what would happen? And then he was silent on it. I think he didn't talk to me after that because he immediately felt that this was a threat to his wealth accumulation. But um, so what he does is that he has a very nice life. He lives in a big house. He has four to five cars at any point in time. He drives his Bentleys and Lamborghinis. And so amongst his friends, we would talk about his cars as the most conspicuous forms of consumption with a mixture of envy and disdain. So when we were younger, it was more towards the envy side. We were older now, it's more towards the disdain side. And maybe in this room, because you're all from the non-profit sector, it's more towards the disdain side. You know, who needs so many cars? And so we were talking and we were thinking, you know, uh, one person doesn't need five luxury cars. If it were a worker-owned co-op, maybe all his massage therapists would be able to buy a Toyota. Uh, but then we also think, you know, Lando, uh, uh, because of climate change, even though you can afford a Toyota Corolla, you should all just take public transport in any case. But that's the, you know, that's 
that's how I kind of my own personal experience with this. And I'm very taken, you know, if massage therapists own their own companies, if taxi drivers own their own ride sharing platform, if delivery riders and restaurants, you know, have their own food delivery platforms, and of course cleaners, these things exist already elsewhere. And so, um, and last week we had Equal Care Co-op. They're really interesting platform co-op, social care co-op. And they came and they shared about how, you know, it's both the carers as well as the recipients of care who form a co-op together. And the investors, they have such a sophisticated way of thinking about it that the people who put in money would have only 10% of the votes. And it's the people who work and the people who are receiving care that should have a majority of the say in how the company is run. And so I'm wondering, you know, this is also great to me. And uh, do I have some blinders on? Am I the only one excited by this? So I wanted to bring everyone to have this conversation uh, to keep me in check, right? Maybe I'm getting too excited about this. And so without further ado, can I invite Trevor to come share with us about platform co-ops? Over to you, Trevor. Yeah, my pleasure. And I really couldn't have had a better uh, segue than what Justin just provided, uh, because I will uh, start by talking about the person that cleans my home. And I, um, I'm also lazy, uh, like Justin. And so I have a photo of her here. And this is not actually my house. Doesn't look anywhere near that fancy. But um, this is uh, Esmeralda Flores, and uh, she is a house cleaner in New York City. And like many house cleaners, she is part of the gig economy, which means that she uses a tech platform, uh, you know, an app to find clients. And But unlike other house cleaners who use typical tech platforms, Esmeralda makes $25 an hour. Uh, so that is twice as much as she used to make before joining her current company, meaning she makes a living wage. And as Marada's company, uh, there is no algorithmic boss. And maybe I should explain that a little bit. So in the gig economy, you have uh, one of the problems that workers face is that they are controlled by very opaque uh, algorithms, right? So they don't really know what's happening uh, on, on that platform, why drivers are sent to a certain area, for example, et cetera, or you know, like how their pay is even changed from one day to the other. And uh, so these kind of uh, changes um, you know, are not happening on this platform, which gives Esmeralda really more stability, right? And her family more stability. Every week or so, uh, she and her co-workers get together to make decisions that determine how the company should operate. And Esmeralda receives training about marketing and finance and conflict resolution, giving her an oppor opportunity to grow within her company. Right? So uh, now you may be wondering, right, like what tech platform is this uh, that, how are they able to provide Esmeralda and her colleagues with these benefits? How is that even possible? And uh, the answer is uh, up and go. So it's not your typical tech platform. Here you see some of the workers. It's what's called a platform cooperative. And if you haven't heard, about this term, uh, let me explain that to you. It means that house cleaners share the ownership and the management of the platform, and each gets an equal vote in decision-making uh, when it comes to wages or benefits and much more. So it's a truly democratic workplace. And I think that really democratic workplaces uh, is what we need right now. Right. Especially at the time when we see tech platforms deny workers living wage benefits, so very much what Justin had just talked about, and perhaps you read the article in The Guardian uh, with this huge leak um, of uh, files at Uber that shows how they really uh, meddled with uh, public policy and tried to twist policymakers in their favor in quite dubious ways. Um, so, you know, at, especially at a time when, you know, workers are denied the right to organize, widening economic inequality in the process. So I think it's really time to spread democracy in the workplace. So platform cooperatives are one way 
to make that happen. So now I know that for some of you, when you hear the word cooperative, uh, you may think of you know, elderly people who are supported through cooperatives in Singapore, or you might think of uh, credit unions and, you know, the 85 cooperatives uh, that, uh, you know, involve some 1.5 million people uh, in your country. But, uh, you know, credit unions are only one type of cooperatives. Uh, cooperatives in general are basically just a group of people who come together to address a particular need, right? So they turn to each other in times of crisis, right? So when safety nets of governments uh, fall through uh, or when safety nets of markets fall through or safety nets of families fall through, right? People turn to each other and they try to solve those needs, address those needs. And whether that need is house cleaning or getting an affordable loan, right? From a credit union. So they are based on shared ownership and decision-making, and they are really nothing new, right? So consumer co-ops, as we know them, have been around since 1844, as many of you may know, towards the end of the Industrial Revolution in Northern England. Textile weavers saw their pay cut in half, uh, which made it difficult for them to afford food. And so they all got together to start a cooperative where they sold uh, oatmeal and flour and sugar so that the textile weavers and their families, uh, you know, could afford to eat. And today co-ops, you know, in agriculture, not just uh, credit unions, right, are really big. You've probably heard of, I don't know, Ocean Spray and Land O'Lakes, at least in the United States, those are really, really large cooperatives. And that's really true all over the world, right? The cooperatives in agriculture, in many countries make up at least you know, half of the agricultural production of those countries, but also in service in the service industry as well. Uh, so platform co-ops in particular combine these two models, these tried and true models, right? That of the successful almost 200 year old model of cooperatives with the much younger model of digital platforms. So, and here's what makes them different, right? They are, made uh, up of a group of people who each get an equal vote in decision-making when it comes to how much workers should be paid and whether or not data should be collected and to whom they are sold. And another thing that makes them different is they give power to the people and they scale equality, right? So one way is uh, through higher pay. But also consider that uh, Esmeralda, um, who I showed you was cleaning my house, works in an industry, the house cleaning industry, which uh, is, has a turnover rate of 75%. I even found some data that referred to 400%, as much as a 400% turnover rate, right? So anywhere between 75 and 400. Uh, but Esmeralda has been with the company for over three years, which is almost as long as it, it exists. And what's the reason? Well, one reason is, of course, that there's a higher pay, right? I mentioned earlier that she is paid twice as much as she used to be paid before. And that is also true for equal care that Justin mentioned. Uh, I talked with one of the carers from uh, Man near Manchester, and for him, that was that was also true, right? So he now makes twice as much. And uh, he mentioned to me that now he can afford a gym membership, right? A membership in a fitness center, which uh, really helps him and his health, right? So that he is not so stressed uh, in his job as a care worker. So, but typical tech platforms uh, take, uh, and Justin mentioned it as well, between 25% and 50%. Uh, in the case that Justin mentioned, actually even more. Right? And as a commission, which is really an exorbitant amount uh, for immigrants who make up the majority of the gig economy workforce. So platform co-ops take much less. The women at Up and Go decided to use 5%, right? 5% of the revenue to pay for running the platform uh, and uh, credit card fees. 
And that means that 95% of the revenue go to the women at these cooperatives, right? So the women are earning 95% of the revenue. And there, so there's also another reason that Esmeralda can earn more, which is that the company doesn't have a fiduciary duty to shareholders to maximize profit, right? To maximize their earning. So no Lamborghinis for those owners, right? The case that Justin had described. And here's another thing that makes um, platform co-ops different because everyone at Up and Go from the house cleaners to support staff co-own the platform. This also means that they own the intellectual property uh, for this digital platform. Uh, and that means that Esmeralda and her co-owners can use the software to build a network of companies, which they are now starting to do with a platform cooperative also in Philadelphia. So they can start a social franchise. And lastly, consider that Up and Go is made up mostly of women from Latin America. And if they were a typical gig economy platform in need of venture capital funding, the data shows us that the chances of these minority women-led founder teams to find funding are very, very slim. Right? So somewhere around you know, two to 3%. And in the single digits. Yeah. meaning that these women wouldn't have even been able to start a tech platform in the first place, right? If it wouldn't have been for this platform co-op. So let alone provide a fair and equitable option for house cleaners to make a living or add some much needed diversity to the Tech Founders Club. So today, there are hundreds of platform co-ops like Up and Go all over the world and uh, they work in uh, more ways than one. So the data shows us that they are more resilient in times of crisis. So after the startup phase, right? uh, after the startup phase, they are more resilient um, and that they are more productive, uh, often pay better and retain more workers simply because they're happier right, at the company. So as you can see, um, I uh, believe that platform co-ops are a better and fairer way uh, and a fairer alternative. And that's why a few years ago, I, uh, together with a few friends, we started the Platform Co-op Consortium at the New School in New York City, simply to, to support and be, be a hub to help to start, grow and convert to platform cooperatives. And we basically do whatever we can to support this uh, global ecosystem, which now has some 500 businesses in more than 40 countries. And that's just the one we know of. Uh, there are many more. So, you know, nobody is, uh, needs to uh, register their platform co-op with the government. So it's very hard for us to actually get those data. Exactly. We are trying to reach out to more and more. Apex organizations to find out uh, how many platform co-ops there are exactly, but that's at least uh, the companies we know. So let me tell you, just give, let me tell you, give you an example. There's a you know, directory on our website, which you can check out uh, where you can actually see uh, the platform co-ops. Uh, I haven't checked, I should have checked before this talk if there are some in Singapore in our directory, you can check that yourself by going to our website, going platform.coop, you go to resources and you find the directory. So, but let me tell you about uh, just uh, three companies initially, and then I can give you a few more examples to show you the wider array of uh, companies. So there's a uh, co-op ride, which is the name of the app uh, of the drivers cooperative in New York City. They now have uh, 6,700 drivers and uh, pay between 10 and 30% more than the big ride-sharing platforms with the aim of closing the racial wealth gap in New York City. Pass passengers pay about 5% less than uh, any other platforms. Even though they are a new company, they are already one of the largest worker co-ops in the United States. In fact, to be honest, the largest worker co-op, but uh, they're still relatively young. So I still hesitate a little bit to um, emphasize that. 
Um, and there's so much more to say about this. Maybe in the discussion, we can talk about them because they also have an interesting partnership with the city. So I think um, the this kind of public private relationship that uh, they exemplify, uh, we should maybe talk more about uh, in the discussion section. Next, uh, there is uh, FairBNB, of which I'm also a cooperative member and uh, part of their board, uh, director of their board, I should uh, disclose. And they are a community focused alternative to short term rental platforms, think Airbnb, surprise, surprise. Um, they will soon be available in 120 cities and towns and already have over 4,500 4, hosts. And half of Air Fairbnb's commission, you could say the distinguishing value proposition here is that half of their commission goes to community projects. Um, think of a playground or whatever the community identifies as a project that they would like to support. Uh, there is, for example, the support of food distribution center in Genova, Italy. Uh, that's uh, yeah, one of the examples. So if you want to have a fair vacation, uh, you should use fair BNB. Now, um, you might be wondering, uh, and, and I know that there will be some of you that are skeptical and that you might be saying, if you are not a big co-op supporter yet, you may say like, well, 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 Trevor here, if everyone gets to say, you know, how are these platforms are not a complete mess, right, in terms of leadership, right? And the answer is, uh, you know, you know, uh, as, you know, Oscar Wilde is attributed with saying, you know, um, the problem with socialism is that it cuts into your evenings, right? So isn't this uh, total, you know, self-exploitation and a complete mess in terms of management and the answer is like just like anyone else they hire management and they hire skilled uh, programmers often tech cooperatives um, and the difference however is that the rules of management that that management enforces were determined by everybody right determined by all and management is accountable to workers and the workers can fire management at any time so, so far I told you about how platform co-ops are transforming labor sectors, right? I talked about transportation, I talked about short-term rental, um, and, uh, but I should emphasize that they should, that they also have the potential to change entire other industries, such as care, right? So we talked about this platform co-op, equal care. Um, I'm sure Kate did a fantastic job in presenting this. Uh, but there's, they are also present in the culture and arts sector, uh, higher education, and the data economy, right? So using this cooperative ownership form to create cooperative data trusts, for example. So if you're interested in that, that's maybe also something we could talk more about in the discussion section. What it would be like if uh, data were managed by a cooperative, or even imagine social media cooperatives that are owned by their users, right? A platform like that has no fiduciary duties to shareholders, and which means that they can decide which data are collected in the first place, right? I mean, that's true for all cooperatives, platform cooperatives, right? They have a bit more control, right? So they can decide which data they want to collect on their users, on their workers, and then how those data are shared uh, and with whom. They don't have complete control, right? They are often, Amazon is still in the picture, but they have a degree of control and access. So they can offer more transparency and privacy and make users the beneficiary of the data that they generate. So, and that's a pretty big deal. And I know that all of this discussion, I'm sure also in Singapore, um, and remember fondly, uh, visiting and speaking in Singapore not so many years ago. It was a wonderful time. Uh, you, I, I know that you know, there's, of course, a strong influence of Silicon Valley. And you might be thinking about scalability, right? So a few things on that. So platform co-ops don't really scale in the tradition, traditional Silicon Valley sense. I mean, they kind of do. So in 2019, up and go, um, 
growth uh, went up 97% from 2018. But remember, right, that's not really the goal, right? So platform co-ops, the goal is not to go public or maximize profit like a traditional tech platform. They scale differently, right? So they scale more affordably than brick and mortar cooperatives because they are online. They scale by creating networks of smaller cooperatives and that is how they are able to compete with larger companies, which is also not so surprising because that's exactly what uh, cooperatives have done in Italy and in Finland and in Denmark and in New Zealand, right? In all these places in Kerala, India, where they have grown, right? So they have, um, they form federations, right? Coalitions, alliances, where small cooperatives work together to then compete uh, with larger, uh, cooperatives. I'm here in the Basque country in where I'm a, a visiting professor at uh, Mondragon University. And there's a story that people here often tell about the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, and when, uh, you know, they uh, decided who will uh, build the Guggenheim Museum, uh, con the construction job, they were basically saying like, well, the Basque country is tiny, you would never be able to uh, do a, a job like that. And the government of the Basque country says like, well, that's true, you know, as a single construction company, there is really none that could surf and build the Guggenheim Museum, but all of them taken together, they could. And that's exactly what happened. So that's also how platform co-ops scale. So, and they scale more quickly because members of co-ops can be anywhere in the world. Uh, look at Stuxi, which is in 57 countries. Um, and they scale democracy because power can be decentralized uh, through the blockchain. And that's exactly why I want instructors right, to tell their students about platform cooperatives in law schools and business schools. So there's, at, you know, at least in the United States uh, and most countries I know, uh, an absolute lack of presence of uh, curriculum on cooperatives in law schools and business schools. So I tried to change that uh, in my work at um, Harvard as an affiliate faculty. And why I encourage entrepreneurs to consider starting one instead of another typical gig, gig platform. And why I think that incubators that could also be supported by the government in Singapore should include platform cooperatives and why I think that unions should start platform co-ops and why I want ethical social impact investors to consider them and create an amazing legacy of equality. So again, like addressing the skeptics among you, I'm definitely not here to tell you that uh, this is a form of business that's a one size fits all solution to fix economic inequality. Neither platform co-ops uh, nor cooperatives in general, I think, are a silver bullet, but they are part of a larger picture because that, that can very much address those needs. And we need definitely more variety in the economy. You know, think of, uh, you know, private, small private companies, tech worker alliances, employee ownership, and yes, also platform cooperatives. Because we face big challenges, um, but here's what gives me a lot of hope. Right? Um, when markets fail and government safety nets break down, people turn to each other, like I said before, and people cooperate to form credit unions as you did in Singapore, and so that you know they can uh, address their financial needs and they form platform co-ops so they can make a living uh, cleaning people's homes. And when markets and governments for too long fail to address structural racism and economic inequality, they form institutions like the, in the United States, at least the Black Panthers free breakfast program for children, which is still the legacy of why children get uh, free breakfasts in public schools. Uh, or the AFL-CIO, the largest federations of union in the United States. So the aspiration to participatory democracy has spread in countries all over the planet. And now it's time for it to spread in the workplace. 
So this was my uh, first uh, introduction uh, to platform co-ops uh, for you. And uh, now I just want to just give you quickly a few examples to go a bit more into detail. So this is up and go that I detailed already. I talked about the drivers cooperative. Um, this is equal care. I, I heard that you had a wonderful introduction by Kate already. So that's exciting. I don't need to introduce this more. Uh, Savvy. Savvy is a platform co-op uh, that is uh, designed for patients with chronic diseases and um, allows them collectively to uh, participate in research studies, right? Uh, so which are often uh, well paid, but uh, in the United States at least have an, a majority of white women that take part in those studies. And uh, so they are trying to change that and give more equitable access to those studies through a platform where uh, medical companies can essentially ask question and then have almost like a little Facebook of patients with chronic diseases that can then respond and get compensated for the answers. Um, yeah, Signalize is uh, a multi-stakeholder cooperative run by its members to provide interpreting services. There are many uh, in this uh, sector, many platform cooperatives. Um, you know, Guerrilla Translation, Guerrilla Translation is another one, um, and uh, there are many more. Then uh, you have in Quebec, uh, the uh, EVA, which is a platform co-op for taxis. And uh, that is a social franchise model. So that allows worker cooperatives from uh, South Africa to uh, the Ivory Coast uh, and of course Canada and uh, you know, potentially all over the world to uh, use their, their marketing, their, their brand and also their uh, blockchain power technology to run a platform uh, cooperative uh, in their country. And this, you know, I've been working with Uber drivers in uh, Cape Town, South Africa for at least uh, six years. And uh, they had many struggles uh, starting their own platform cooperative and struggles were, you know, as simple as, you know, having a decent website designed, having a decent logo, you know, writing their bylaws, all of that becomes very overwhelming for, for workers who really have no time in the first place, right? So they're, you know, not starting from scratch, right? But replicating an existing model has been a huge uh, a benefit. And this is something that also just as a note aside, I want to recommend to anything you do in Singapore as well, like do not start from scratch. You know, I beg you, do not start from scratch. But you know, you can approach us at the Platform Corp Consortium. We can put you in touch with people who want to start similar projects in other country or have already built those projects so that you don't start looking for these hundreds of thousands of dollars to build your platform. When in fact, many other people have done that already and you can share those technology, right? So sharing digital infrastructure becomes incredibly important for the platform co-op ecosystem. And it's an amazing uh, advantage of uh, doing business online, which is that, you know, you can share your software through, well, either open source or more commonly uh, share, -alike, uh, share alike licenses. So for example, the uh, Creative Commons Plus license uh, allows businesses to, um, uh, which which is used by Co-op Cycle, for example, in Paris, which is uh, uh, which you know you mentioned uh, a food delivery platform. This is really something you should consider. So they uh, license their software for free for worker cooperatives, right? So if you are a worker cooperative and much preferably using bicycles, so they also have this sort of climate catastrophe angle in there, uh, then you can use their software for free. Uh, otherwise, you are not allowed to use the software at all, right? So you can, it's, it's called a source available software. So you can look at the software, but you can't use it commercially unless you are a worker cooperative. So that's a, a little side comment on scaling. Uh, for the freelancers uh, among you, there is uh, SMART, which um, 
is uh, following the same model. So it's a replication model in so far nine European countries with over 35,000 members, which turns uh, freelancers into employees of the cooperative uh, when they work on a gig, which brings uh, protections under labor law uh, to those um, companies, uh, to those freelancers, usually in the arts, uh, but also in other sectors. And uh, so that obviously is a little bit different in each country, right? So for example, here in Spain where I'm right now, like they, they don't have a digital platform at all, but in Belgium, they follow a very uh, sophisticated uh, uh, digital platform that helps freelancers uh, with their taxes uh, and so on. So uh, very much uh, customized to each country. When they started in Germany, they just opened a small store and basically said to freelancers, you know, what do you need? Bring us your taxes. Uh, so they came with these piles of paper and, uh, and they helped them with their taxes for free initially to just figure out what freelancers really need. And uh, then they found their sort of niche, right? Like which service is uh, needed and they provided that. Uh, some of you may be in, excited by um, Web3 technologies, distributed technologies, so namely blockchain and also the crypto economy. So here's just a small example of a company. It's, it's, it's not like a full-fledged platform co-op, but it's on its way. So they call themselves a you know, cooperative. They call themselves a collective. Like many people in that space refer to themselves as cooperatives, not always quite rightly so. So there's a bit of co-op washing going on as well, but not with this one. So this is a network of uh, programmers uh, that uses, um, um, you know, these Web3 technologies, uses blockchain to create this worldwide um, cooperative of um, programmers that essentially can uh, establish a reputation through the blockchain. So you can basically know for sure that the person is competent that you're working with and uh, also uh, use uh, blockchain for governance, right? So to really make sure that it's uh, democratically run. Uh, yeah, don't have really time to go much more into this, but it's super interesting. There are many, many uh, uh, distributed autonomous organizations that act uh, also somewhat like uh, uh, cooperatives um, and yeah, maybe we can talk about that more in the discussion as well. So I'm just gonna, uh, I, I will just stop here and yeah, I mean, open to any questions and I'm happy to address any concerns you may have. I'll stop the sharing here. Thank you so much, Trevor. There are a bunch of questions, but uh, some of them you have answered. Maybe we'll just take one, uh get you to answer one question, then I'll go on to Kate. Uh -huh. uh, Christopher Guy, my colleague, is asking uh, about when the platform co-ops like Up and Go branch into other locations, do the original platform owners acquire a stake in the branch co-op? Oh, could you repeat this? Uh, there was uh, uh, a little so, bit of breakout. I didn't quite hear the full sorry. question. Yeah. Uh, when platform co-ops like Up and Go branch into new locations, do the original mm -hmm. platform owners acquire a stake in the branch co-op? Yeah. yeah, well, that's that's a big question, right? So, um, I mean, it's it's very complex, right? Also, the this this question of just just to also not give you a rosy picture of all of this unfolding uh, beautifully without any problems uh, th there are lots of contradictions and problems there right so like you know when you think about this dual identity of uh, worker owners and worker cooperatives where they at the at the same time owners but they all which um, you know means they have to compete in the market while at the same time, there are also workers who want to be paid more and maybe have more vacation and all that. So that these, this kind of dual identity is of course a little bit at intention there, right? And, uh, but you know, worker co-ops have figured this out uh, for 200 years, right? So it's nothing new. Um, and this comes also a bit to play when it comes to uh, franchising because the workers at Up and Go were basically saying like, well, uh, you know, they were not all that interested in, in, in franchising because, you know, life was good for them, right? So like, why grow this model? 
But now the question is, yes, they, they do have the intellectual property of the, they own the intellectual property of the software. And now they're they are considering like whether to charge for that or not, like a small fee, you know? Yeah, they do, they, they do think about that. I don't think it's quite resolved yet, um, but it was a discussion, I can say that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Trevor. And uh, we'll we'll have more question, time for questions later. But uh, now I would like to go to Kate to tell us more about uh, seed comments. Over to you, Kate. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is uh, my name is Kate Katib. I am based in Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States. Um, and uh, as Justin said, I am a worker owner at a cooperative here in Baltimore called Red Emma's. Um, and I am also the co-director of, of Seed Commons, which is a national community wealth cooperative um, that helps um, small worker owned businesses get access to the capital that they need to, to grow and to expand and, and to thrive. Um, and I am going to share some slides, but but before I do that, I want to I want to tell you a little bit about about my story um, and uh, and how that kind of leads the road to to seed comments um, because the growth and development of my co-op is very much a part of the story of of how seed comments came to be. So I um, back in two thousand three. Um, I started a, uh, a small community bookstore and coffee shop in, in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I come from a community organizing background um, and uh, had been working as a, as a labor organizer and an activist um, and came together with a number of other people, seven to be exact, um, to try and figure out how to create a community institution in Baltimore um, that could do two things. One, provide a, a laboratory for experimentation in workplace democracy. So how do we take the principles that we have as organizers and activists in the labor space and actually translate that to a concrete business environment? And at the same time, how do we create a platform um, and, a, and a public space for people to come together and to, um, to cross pollinate, to, to share ideas. Um, I was very based in the, in the world of information sharing um, and the bookstore was kind of a, 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 a key component of that as well as an event space, but we also were, trying to see if we could run a sustainable business. So we added another component, which was a, which was a cafe, right? I'd been working as a barista. I had some cooking experience um, and some wait staff experience in my past. And, and I was kind of like, yeah, I can design a cafe. No problem. Sure, we can do that. So we started this cafe, seven of us. Um, and um, we sustained that cafe for about 10 years. Um, and it was... It was incredibly successful. I won't say that it was like hugely financially successful, um, but it was successful enough to grow, to develop, to generate enough revenue that we were able to profit share, um, that we were able to start additional projects in, in Baltimore City. Um, we were certainly able to organize a lot of cultural programming and political programming. And then in 2013, we sat down and we took a look at the project and we've been doing this for a decade at that point. And we said, okay, well, this, this is great. We've experimented, we found some models that work. Now we wanna see if we can take this to the next level and actually make this a business that can sustain us as, as workers. And so we knew that we had to scale. We knew that we had to expand because we had to get you know, we were a small project in 800 square feet. Um, we could seat 15 people in the cafe um, and then we could cram some more in for events. What happens if we take this thing we've been doing successfully for a decade and we supersize it and we grow into a 5,000 square foot space and we add a full commercial kitchen and a full menu and expand the books and have the capacity to book larger events, what, what does that do for us? Does that get us to the point where we can pay living wages and we can sustainably pay living wages and think about things like benefit and insurance? 
So we found a space, we did some crowdfunding, and we knew that we needed to get a loan. We needed about, I think around $50,000 um, to, to cover the cost of renovations that we needed to complete um, and to, to kind of fill the gap in what we needed to get to get to that next stage. And so we went to the bank, the bank that we'd been banking with for a decade. And we said, we've been in business for, for 10 years. Um, we're a worker-owned cooperative. We have positive cash flow for you know nine of those 10 years. It's not a lot, but it's positive. Could we please have a loan for $50,000? And they said, well, who, who owns the business? And we said, well, there are 12 of us at this point. We equally own the business. We're a worker-owned cooperative. And they said, well, we're, we, we just want the owner's information. And we said, well, there's 12 of us. Do you want 12 people's information? We're all happy to, to sign this document. Um, and the bank said, no, we're not gonna do that. Um, choose the three people who have the best credit and the most assets and put them on the loan application. And then we'll, we'll process your loan application and give you your loan. And so we went back and we thought about this for a minute. And, and we decided to, to refuse um, for a couple of key reasons, because we were a group of workers. Um, most of us didn't have personal assets. Um, a lot of us didn't have good credit. Folks had been um, in the service industry for a long time. Um, a lot of people were not coming from, um, from personal wealth and hadn't grown up with, with access to credit and credit building opportunities. And we didn't want to introduce into our cooperative a, an informal hierarchy where suddenly some people had more on the line than other people did. Um, and we didn't want to replicate the same logic of exclusion that we already saw across, um, across workplaces in America, um, where you have to have access to capital to get access to capital, right? You already have to have money. You already have to have assets. You already have to have good credit in order to get access to the money that you need to build a business that's going to sustain you in the future, right? There is a logic of economic exclusion that cooperatives are designed um, to try and work around or to try and work outside of or even to, to, to overturn or to turn on its head. And so Red Emma said, well, we don't want to be a part of that. So we got to figure out some other way to do this. So we started talking to nonprofits. We started talking to CDFIs, which is Community Development Financial Institutions. So nonprofit lenders that are designed um, to work for to work um, on behalf of small businesses, to work um, specifically with um, marginalized and excluded communities. Um, we started talking to really anybody who would who would listen to us, and we pieced together the financing that we needed from a few different sources. Um, and it was hard, it was hard to come up with the money. It took us a year to do it. Um, and then it took us another year to actually do the renovations and get into our space. Um, but once we did, um, you know, we moved into that space in, in 2014 um, and we were incredibly successful. Um, we were fortunate that we were able to get the support that we needed to take our little business and supersize it. And so we went from seven people, you know, I think we were 12 people at that point who were you know, making a profit share. Sometimes it was $4 an hour, sometimes it was $10 an hour. It depended on, on how the business was doing that week to a point where we, will, we were able to consistently start people at $11 an hour, which at that point was the living wage in Baltimore City. Sounds really low, but at the time, um, that was competitive in our industry. And we were able to grow from a 12 person co-op of people, um, you know, not making enough to su sustain themselves um, with other jobs on the side to um, one of the, I think actually the largest democratically controlled workplace in Maryland um, with 30 people um, making a living wage. And many of those people actually transitioning into ownership of the business. Um, 
And we managed to do it in just a couple of years. And the reason that we managed to do it was yes, a decade of, of organizing and experimentation, but also the fact that we were able to get access to capital and to get access to capital in a way that worked for us, that was designed for, um, for businesses like us. And most of that capital came from an organization in New York City called The Working World. Um, the Working World was a, uh, is a democratic lender um, that got its start working in Argentina um, in the reclaimed factory movement. So in the wake of the Argentine economic crisis, um, there was a, a huge swell of factory closures. Um, and there was a equally large swell of workers um, taking over those factories, reinvigorating them, reopening them under democratic control. Um, and the folks who started the working world had gotten really inspired um, as a part of, of this, um, this wave of worker power and worker control in Argentina and had helped to design some of the financing that made that possible. So in 2011 and 2012, they brought that model back to the United States. Um, they worked with workers in um, Chicago, Illinois, to take over a, um, a doors and windows factory, um, which became one of the one of the first really big cooperative conversions um, in, in our current era of cooperative development. There have obviously been many other ones in the past, but um, that was the creation of new era windows. Um, and that was a hugely inspiring um, labor struggle and a, and a union co-op struggle um, that led to um, kind of a new wave of cooperative conversions in the United States. So Red Emma's had been watching this um, we knew, obviously, we'd been inspired by Argentina. We'd been inspired by um, the transition into new era windows. So we chased down um, Brendan Martin, who was at that point the executive director of the working world. Like I literally followed this dude around New York City, trying to track him down to be like, hey, can you help my co-op? Because I can't find financing anywhere else. Please, 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 please. And I finally managed to corner him and we sat down, we had a conversation and then we sent a bunch of financials um, and we and we worked through it, and Red Emma's became one of the first loans that they did in the United States after um, after New Era Windows, and it was pretty amazing. It was the first time that anyone had ever looked at Red Emma's and said, "Y'all have been running a cooperative business for ten years. This is amazing. Let's let's actually talk about how you got to where you are, and let's talk about where you want to go. The technical assistance and the technical support that came with." a comparatively small loan of $25,000 um, was transformative for us. It absolutely pushed us to think very, very differently about our business um, and about the, the possibilities of our business. So fast forward to 2015, Red Emma's had expanded. We were successful. Um, we, were, um, we were really trying to think about what comes next for our business and what comes next for the one or two other worker cooperatives in Baltimore City. And key for all of us, for every worker co-op that, um, that was really thinking about expansion and sustaining ourselves was this question of capital. How do we not have this same experience? How do we not have to go to New York City and chase somebody around to, to beg for $25,000? So we went back to the working world and said, you guys have been amazing. You helped us so much. Can you help us to form a loan fund that's like the working world here in Baltimore City? we should have something that is local. We should be able to go to someone here in our own city and say, hey, this is what we're trying to do. Can you, can you help us? Because there was nothing of the sort and the banks, every co-op was running into the same issues with the banks. The banks just didn't get it. Um, and the working world said, you know, it's funny you should say that. We've been talking to other people in other cities who are, who are dealing with similar challenges. And instead of, helping you to start a totally independent loan fund. What if we take our fund, which has been in existence for you know, a decade at this point, what if we take our fund, we turn that into a national financial cooperative and we raise money at a national level 
and then we deploy it at a local level. And that was the creation of Seed Commons in, in 2015. So Red Emma's in Baltimore, the Fund for Democratic Communities in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, uh, you know, Cooperation Richmond in Richmond, California, the Boston Ujima Project in Boston, um, in Boston, Massachusetts, and a number of other organizations came together in 2015 and sat down to hash out, how do we do this? How do we create a platform that will allow us to finance worker-owned cooperatives in a way that keeps the control and keeps the, the technical assistance um, local and helps to build local cooperative ecosystems? Um, and so we did that 2015. Um, we made, uh, in Baltimore, we created the Baltimore Roundtable for Economic Democracy. We made the we were um, we made the first loan using the Seed Commons infrastructure to a small ice cream factory, a black-owned ice cream factory called Taharka Brothers, that was interested in um, in transitioning to worker ownership. It's a fifteen thousand dollar loan, um, and over the last um, seven years since that first loan was made in twenty sixteen. We've invested just over $5 million in Baltimore's cooperatives. Um, we went from having two worker-owned cooperatives and one hopeful worker-owned cooperative, right? We had Red Emma's, we had Baltimore Bicycle Works, um, and then we had Taharka Brothers that was interested in converting. So we had, you know, two, two and a half co-ops back in, in 2015. Um, we have over 20 now. So there's pretty significant, um, pretty significant growth. And these are all, um, these are brick and mortar co-ops. So these are um, restaurants, massage studios, bike shops, catering companies, construction companies. Um, you know, these are, um, these are small shops, generally between five and 30 workers. Harker Brothers um, has 50 workers now, actually. Um, and uh, it, across all of the cooperatives, the workers make a living wage. Most of them have access to, to benefits um, or some degree of, of health care, whether it's an, an employee plan or health care stipend. Um, and all of our cooperatives um, have a pathway to ownership for the employees who, who work there. Not all the employees take it, um, but that pathway is there. And this is really important for us in a city like Baltimore, which is experiencing massive population decline and has been for the last um, couple of decades. Baltimore is a city with an infrastructure that's built to support just over a million, um, just over a million people, we're under 600,000 people now. Um, so that's pretty significant decline that we've seen over the last couple of decades. And it continues to decline. And part of the reason is that um, people don't stay in Baltimore. People grow up in Baltimore and then they leave because they're looking for economic opportunity somewhere else. Um, we're a majority black city. We're 66% um, African-American. Um, and by and large, um, folks who grow up young and black in Baltimore are often told there's not opportunity for you here. You have to go somewhere else um, if you really want to, to build, um, if you want to build wealth, if you want to, if you want to sustain yourself and your family, you have to look outside of this city. And one of the things that we've seen over the last um, you know, decade or in, in the case of Ren Emma's, the last couple decades of doing this work is that um, cooperatives have, have started to provide an opportunity for people who were born and raised in Baltimore to stay here and to have a reason to stay here um, and to concretely invest in the, um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the city that they grew up in um, and to invest in a way that um, that doesn't just benefit them, but benefits their, their entire community. Um, and Seed Commons was really the opportunity for us to, to do that. Without that access to capital, we wouldn't have been able to, to grow at the rate that we've grown um, and to accomplish what we've accomplished. So I'll real quickly just run you through um, kind of a, a picture of what Seed Commons, um, what Seed Commons looks like and how it, how it functions. 
Give me one sec. Okay, you guys see that? Yeah, all right, great. Okay, so, um, all right, so Seed Commons, um, we call it a community wealth cooperative. Um, we also sometimes will talk about it as a financial cooperative. Um, and we'll look a little bit at, at what does that mean? What does it mean that it's a cooperative? How is it governed? Um, but to give you a sense of scale, um, Seed Commons, again, was founded in 2015. We have $20 million currently deployed. Um, so we've lent out over $20 million. Some of that capital has been returned, but currently there's 20 million invested in cooperatives um, around the country. Um, our loans impact um, just under 15,000 workers across the country. Um, I do wanna flag that, that, that these numbers actually don't include we do work with a couple of platform cooperatives, including the Drivers Cooperative, um, which Trevor mentioned. Um, and these numbers don't include our, our platform co-ops. So these are just the, the brick and mortar workplaces. Um, and, uh, and we have 30 peer members um, across the country. So I mentioned that in Baltimore, we wanted to create a loan fund in Baltimore. Um, so we, instead of creating our own loan fund, we became a local node in the Seed Commons network, which was being formed at that point. So there are 30 nodes, just like Baltimore, around the country, um, where, where we are building the infrastructure um, and deploying capital directly into those worker-owned and community-controlled businesses. Um, and here is a very small map. Uh, that, that shows you kind of the spread of where we are around the country. You can also find this map on our website in a much larger format so that you can read everybody's, um, everybody's names. Um, but you can see we're pretty, we're pretty concentrated around the coast. So big East Coast presence, a, a decent West Coast presence, and then not a lot in the middle of the country. Um, something that, that um, that is, is interesting and I think has a little bit to do with the sectors that we work in, which tend to be concentrated a little bit more around the coasts. Um, but it's something that we're, we're working on um, continuing to develop. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about our fund um, and who we lend to and, and how we're structured. So as a fund, um, we have about $45 million in assets. Um, we're targeting, our target was to get to 50 million by 2023. I think we'll get there probably before the end of the year. Um, and so then people say, well, what's your, what's your next target? Um, you know, now that you've accomplished 50 million, which felt like totally bananas. Um, five years ago, I couldn't have imagined that we would, we would have this much capital that's community controlled. Um, it, the next target is a hundred million. And then after that, a billion, um, we would like to see a billion dollars under cooperative control. Um, that is really the, the end goal, um, because we feel like at that scale, we can make significant impact in the growth and the, and the development opportunities for, for worker owned cooperatives. Um, and we invest in worker owned co-ops so that that's really what we were formed to do. There are a lot of different financing mechanisms for housing cooperatives, for real estate cooperatives, but there are comparatively few for worker-owned cooperatives. And that is because business lending, especially small business lending, is incredibly risky. Um, small businesses have a very low success rate. Um, they are the cornerstone of the American economy, and they have a very, very low success rate. Um, a lot of small businesses close within the first three years. Um, the thing that's interesting is that we have a 98% 98, 98 repayment rate, which is unheard of um, for most small business lenders. And some of that is due to the strength of our technical assistance and the fact that we are working in partnership on a local basis, on a daily basis, in some cases, with the businesses that we lend to to make sure that they're well supported and they can handle any pivots and changes that come their way, because there's a lot of pivots and changes in small business ownership. Um, it's also because of the strength of the cooperative model. Co-ops are hard. 
Um, you know, like Trevor, I don't want to paint a rosy picture. That's like, yeah, form a co-op. It's super easy. It's going to be awesome. It's really hard. I've been doing it for 20 years. It, it is, it is painful every day, but it is also worth it. A small business like mine would not have survived for 20 years, would not have weathered the economic instability, would not have weathered all of the pivots and changes we've had to go through without the ability to be malleable, to change, to adapt, to have other people who could step into leadership at different points when I needed to step out, that really helps to sustain worker-owned cooperatives. Um, and you'll see in co-ops, there's a high retention rate. I mean, yes, it's they're high turnover sometimes. They're often in low-wage industries and people move on to other industries where they can make more money. But you'll find in a lot of worker-owned cooperatives that there are people who have been there for a decade and people who want to continue to stay um, because of the stability, um, because even if their wages aren't increasing as much as they might like, like them to, there are other benefits that go along with worker ownership, like dignity, um, like control of your workplace, like the ability to actually participate in decision-making, in an industry like mine, again, I'm in food service. I came out of a food service background. Um, black and brown people and women and queer and trans people are not treated particularly well in the food service industry. Um, we rarely have a voice. We rarely have good working conditions. Sometimes we have dangerous working conditions. Sometimes we have abusive workplaces. So the value of being able to leave that behind and work in a workplace that doesn't replicate that is incredibly meaningful. And if I can do that and also pay my bills and also feed my kid, then I, I wanna stay in that job. Um, and we find that across our, our industry. And so we also um, target our investments to support workers who are traditionally excluded from economic security. That looks really different in every place, right? If we are lending in Kentucky, we are probably lending in poor white communities. If we are lending in Baltimore City, we are probably lending um, to, uh, to black or immigrant communities. Um, so it, it really varies um, wherever you are contextually in the United States, who is excluded from economic security. But um, especially given that we're kind of concentrated around this coastal areas, 92% of our portfolio is invested in um, businesses that are black owned or owned by people of color. And 63% of our portfolio is invested in um, businesses that are owned, uh, majority owned by women or um, queer and trans people. Um, we work in a few target sectors. So we work um, uh, in uh, food value change. So again, this is food service, but also farming, food distribution, wholesale food production, we have all of those in, in Baltimore, um, in addition to around the country. Custom and local manufacturing, so small factories, um, generally factories and manufacturing that employ under 50 workers. That has been a target for us. Those are often good opportunities for conversion from traditional ownership to worker ownership, and conversions are a big part of what we do these days. The caring industries, so this is home health care, um, one of the, prior to the driver's cooperative, one of the largest cooperatives in the United States um, uh, is Cooperative Home Care Associates, um, which is uh, a home health care co-op based in New York City. We've been working with for a long time. Um, and then energy, so increasingly renewable technologies, solar, insulation, um, that has become a, a growth industry in the United States. And we've seen a lot of interest in cooperatives. We have a number of co-ops that are in that renewable energy sector. Um, and then quickly, just how it works in practice. So what, what does it look like within Seed Commons? So um, we are, uh, we're a little cheesy and we really like to use plant metaphors. I mean, we named our, our project Seed, Seed Commons, named after a seed, our logo is a seed. Um, we like to talk about trees and forests. So we use a tree metaphor um, a lot to explain the structure of, of Seed Commons. Um, so 
you know, what we really have is, um, is Roots, which is our investment team. So again, Seed Commons is based around the idea that we can aggregate our need for capital. We can raise it together. We can sort of centralize that work of having to go out and find people in institutions with money that they want to invest. Um, and we can use that as a resource that supports the entirety of all of our cooperatives and all of our network, um, all of our network around the country. So we have our, our investment team that is sourcing, um, sourcing investments. Some comes from individuals with wealth, some comes from institutions, um, nonprofits, foundations, um, and some comes from, uh, from banks that have uh, an imperative to invest a portion of, uh, of their money, of their money in, um, in things that have community benefit. So there's a variety of sources. And what we do is really shield the cooperatives and shield the peers from having to deal with the investors. So in a traditional investment relationship, the investors are kind of in the business, um, there is a responsibility um, on the part of the business to maximize the return for the investors, for the shareholders. Um, there is often um, kind of a tension in worker-owned cooperatives because you really want all of the decision-making control to be given to the workers. And that's hard to do when you have direct investment um, or venture capital. So what we've done is say the relationship that the investors have is with Seed Commons. It's with the fund. So it works kind of like a mutual fund. Um, the relationship that the co-ops have is with their local, the folks locally. And Seed Commons, our backbone staff, so I work as part of the backbone staff, our job is to, is to network those two things together. So the job of the backbone staff is to provide the infrastructure, the training, the support for people working locally to structure um, sustainable investments in the businesses that they support in their city, in their region. Um, and so it all kind of works together as a, as a living self-sustaining system. Um, I like to remind people that we are, we are cooperative. Um, we are governed by our members. The members are the individual nodes in the Seed Commons network. So Bread, my, um, my loan fund in Baltimore, um, is a member of Seed Commons. So we have a seat on the General Assembly and the Board of Directors. We also have a seat on the Sustainability Committee. So when we make an investment in a cooperative in Baltimore, we approve it locally, and then we bring it to the National Sustainability Committee. And that National Sustainability Committee is made up of representatives from all the member funds around the country, and we work together to craft an investment plan that makes sense. Um, and I think at the beginning, we, I, I think a lot of us were like, do I really want to do that? Do I like, isn't that just kind of giving up the same control to some kind of national organization? I thought the whole point was to build local control. What we have found is that the process of taking our loans and bringing them to other people that are doing the same work that we are doing in different places has resulted in better loans. It has resulted in richer feedback. Um, and much more sustainable plans um, for, for our businesses. So the sustainability committee's responsibility is not to say yes or no, it's to figure out how to say yes. So how do we, how do we support this cooperative in a way that's going to make sense, that is also going to produce um, a return? And this is an important point. So we do a form of lending that we like to talk about as non-extractive. And so for us, what that means there's a number of things. Um, in the simplest form, it means we will never leave a cooperative worse off than, than when we got there, which is not a thing that most lenders um, will, will say. Um, practically, what that means is that all of our repayment is royalty-based. So we do not take loan repayments until a, um, until a business has reached a point of economic sustainability where they can pay their workers, they can pay their overhead, they can do any immediate repairs or expansion they need to do. Then and only then do they start repaying their loans. And that changes sometimes on a monthly basis. So if a co-op has a bad month, they don't make a loan payment. If they have a really good month, they might make a larger loan payment. So when the pandemic came, 
and shut down a lot of our businesses because they were in the food sector um, or other industries that had um, state regulations or federal regulations around, around opening and, and, um, and operations, we didn't have to go and rewrite all of our loan contracts. We didn't have to send people into forbearance. Our loans were already designed in a way that allowed those co-ops to weather those storms and to regulate those payments in a way that made sense for them. Um, and as of now, none of our cooperatives that we lend to have closed as a result of the pandemic, which is pretty, pretty amazing considering that we work with, with small businesses. Um, I'm proud about that every day. And every day I worry that one of our co-ops is gonna, is gonna close, but so far we've been able to sustain everybody. Um, and then this is just a little bit about our approval process. So talking about, we do intake at the local level, we make a decision locally about whether or not that investment fits with our portfolio and whether or not we feel like we have the capacity to support that project. And then we bring it to the national committee um, to ask for money from the national fund. Um, and then these are just some of our co-ops in Baltimore. This is Red Emma's, this is my co-op. Um, we have 20 worker owners now. Um, we generate about $2 million in sales. We just work with Seed Commons to buy a building. So we're one of the first worker owned businesses in Maryland to own its own space, which is, which is a, a big step for us. Um, most restaurants don't own their own space. It's important for us that we can um, so that has been exciting and terrifying. Um, this is Baltimore Bicycle Works. This is one of the other co-ops that helped to start um, Seed Commons. They are, um, they're about 15 workers. They're a bike sales and repair shop. Um, they were founded out of a labor struggle at another bike shop in the area. Um, they're pretty amazing. Um, Mira Kitchen Collective is a catering company that just opened a a restaurant um, or a cafe storefront. Um, they, are, um, they are owned and led by refugees and immigrants, primarily, but not exclusively women. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of interesting stuff that we're working through with them around ownership. It's hard to own something as a refugee in the United States. Um, so can cooperatives be a solution for that? Taharka Brothers, which is the ice cream company that I mentioned. This was started as a social enterprise for black youth in Baltimore City to learn entrepreneurialism through participating, <laughs> participating in, in, in running an ice cream factory. Um, we helped to transition them to worker ownership over a period of five years. Um, they completed their transition. They started in 2015, they completed in 2020. There are guys that when I started working with them back in 2013, we're making 15 bucks an hour. They are now making $70,000 a year. Um, They're generating over $3 million in revenue, which is pretty amazing considering that they were about 350,000 when we started working with them. So they've seen incredible growth. Um, and we have had successive investments in them over the years since that original $15,000 loan. Earthbound Building is a black owned construction company that does sustainable and natural building. Um, we worked with them to finance a couple different things, a line of credit for raw materials, a um, land purchase um, loan for them to, uh, to buy a site um, to, to house their, their workshop um, for their building, um, their building work. Um, and to buy a truck and, and trailer to make them more efficient. Um, and then Appalachian Field Services, which is a, um, a cooperative that um, employs people in, um, in recovery from drug and alcohol abuse and people who are returning from incarceration. Um, they are working on a really interesting project. So their model is that they, they buy row houses. Baltimore has just a, a ridiculous amount of abandoned real estate because of that population decline that I talked about. So they work in a particular neighborhood in Baltimore called Park Circle. They purchase row houses that are, um, that are abandoned, um, that, are, that are derelict and um, pay themselves to renovate those houses. And then as the houses become activated, they become transitional housing or, um, or affordable housing for the members of their recovery community. 
So they're, they're creating a physical community, um, a physical place for everybody to be able to live together, access to housing, but also access to jobs, right? By paying themselves to do those renovations and helping people who are in the recovery and the, um, and the, returning, uh, the returning citizen population um, to gain marketable skills. And they are one of our larger investments. They have um, almost $2 million invested from Seed Commons across a number of properties. Um, so that's it. I'm sorry I ran over a little bit, but I hope that gives you a picture both of how things have grown locally um, and what our cooperative ecosystem looks like in Baltimore, but how that national network was a, was a really fundamental part of that. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, gives me goosebumps to think about all the stuff you're doing. And I, uh, I'm very inspired by that. I think I share Trevor's excitement at the work that you're doing. And uh, just for the, the audience members here, you know, we are really hoping that the, a visit to Kate in Baltimore happens in August. And uh, well, the application date is over, but if you are able to pay for your own, we welcome you to join the study trip. It's likely going to be the end of uh, the 29th of August for a week. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of try to confirm things with Kate and other organizations there. Uh, and once we get confirmation, we'll share with everybody the itinerary. Um, uh, there are many questions, but I think we'll go to the discussions first. Uh, for now, can I invite uh, Mr. Tung Yam, who's the president of the uh, Singapore National Cooperative Federation. And he, he'll do a mini presentation before he shares his reflection. Over to you, President. Yeah, uh, Dr. Justin, uh, uh, Mr. Trevors, uh, Kate, uh, good afternoon to all of you. I guess you are in the morning, am I in the midnight time? time. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna take too long. Uh, my name is Ayam, I'm actually the chairman of Singapore National Cooperative Federation. I've been involved in this uh, SNCF for the last six years and uh, took over as a chairman uh, early last year. And uh, I, Earlier, listen to Kate, you're sharing about cooperative. I personally involved in the cooperative movement for more than 30 years. I'm actually the group chief government officer of NTUC Fair Price Cooperative Limited, the largest consumer supermarket chain in Singapore. So, you know, about doing well and doing good, you know, for our members and so on and so forth. So maybe perhaps that I would like to take this opportunity you know, since I'm, uh, you know, chairman of SNCF, so perhaps that I, it's good for me to share a little bit more about SNCF, what are we doing in Singapore and how we have our cooperative in Singapore. Next slide, please. Okay, so when you look at uh, number of cooperative, actually we have about 84 cooperative in Singapore. Uh, 61 of them, they are uh, SNCF affiliates. So we have 19 credit co-op, 25 service co-op, NTUC co-op, this is where I'm involved in. Uh, there are total 13 and certainly uh, campus co-op four. So when you look at the membership itself is 1.44 million in Singapore. Knowing Singapore population is only about five over million. So we're talking about one in three of the residents in Singapore, they are the co-op members. Yeah, so next slide please. Now, Basically, the SNCF is an APEC body uh, of Singapore cooperative movements. And uh, we are also the secretariat of the uh, Central Cooperative Fund, CCF, under the ministry. Uh, so this is where we get the funding from the government to CCF. And it's formed in 1980. So basically, the mission is very, very clear. We're here to promote and develop cooperative as sustainable enterprises to address social and economic needs for doing well and doing good for our members and certainly beyond just our member alone. It's also about the rest of the population in Singapore. You look at NTC Cooperative, we are not just here to serve our members. Actually, whatever we do, actually it benefit, actually benefit all the shoppers out there, even they are non-members. Yeah, next slide, please. Now, maybe I just want to uh, take you through um, about SNCF and, uh, and how do we go about helping the different uh, co-op set up, you know, in uh, formation of the new cooperative in Singapore. Next slide. Now, basically, SNCF work closely with Registry of Cooperative Society in providing guidelines over the application process. In Singapore, anyone want to set up a co-op, you would have to actually, there's a process that they have to follow. 
and it has to be approved by the uh, Registry of Cooperative Society in Singapore. So I think this is where the role of SNCF comes in. Now, mostly um, applicants will need to have better understanding of the co-op act before anyone come together and say, look, and I want to form a co-op, you know, but first thing first, they need to understand the act first before we actually start forming the co-op. So that's one. And uh, so SNCF will provide one-on-one -on -one session on such uh, what they call conversation, you know, for anyone interested to form a co-op, whether it's a co-op or platform co-op. So I think SNCF, we have the relationship managers uh, here to support all them. The third is actually, we also provide template to assist the applicant in meeting the application requirement. Uh, important, we also help them to make sure they are successful you know, getting the approval from the uh, registrar, you know, RCS uh, approval. And upon successful application, uh, we will provide further assistance for new co-op to become our affiliates and on the grant application. So certainly we also provide the grant, especially for the new setup. Many of them may not have that kind of financial resources in forming co-op. And more so about platform co-op today, you know, you need to have how do we go about setting up the platform co-op, uh, your website, you know, how do you engage your members, your shoppers, and how do you go about providing your services and so on and so forth. This also require, you know, financial and funding and so on and so forth. So maybe go to the next slide, please. Now, interesting over here, I want to share with you, you know, the kind of uh, grant support for new cooperative in Singapore. So you can see that one of the grant newly set up co-op may consider is application for new co-op grant. So basically it acts as a booster, you know, especially for anyone coming together, you get a booster from, uh, you can apply the grant. So for initial stage, you can see from here, on year one, you know, you get 85% of the actual expenditure kept at $100,000, you know, so that's year one, year two, 70% kept at 70,000, year three, 55% of your expenditure kept at 40,000. So certainly this is very helpful right? for anyone wants to form a co-op, even a platform co-op. And once you actually get it approved, you can come to us, you know, and then certainly we'll help you through the application process. And then once it's approved by RCS, and this is where we come in to see how do you go about, you know, getting the support and getting the grant for them to do the proper, uh, proper setup of the co-op. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I also like to take this opportunity to share what are the value adding services that SNCF provides to cooperative, especially for our affiliates. Yeah, next slides. Now uh, we have varieties of grant to assist our co-op, yeah, to enhance their capability and operation function. I know certainly I'm not going to go through the detail, but SNCF office can provide more advice if you need. So from here, you can see productivity solution, uh, CCF development grant, we have CCF training grant, uh, we have CCF basic support grant and as well as CCF special grants. I think, you know, Singapore, basically, I think all Singaporeans here, you know, uh, the participants know that Singapore is very good at giving grants, you know, even the government survive. So I think, you know, uh, we are all here to help the new co-op. Yeah, next slide. Now, uh, these are some examples that we have conduct courses, like co governor for creating co-op. You know, non-graduate related courses like cooperative governing training, induction program, and so, and so forth, learning journey, overseas conferences and courses. So every year we do organize ACLC where the co-op can join the, the trip together to attend overseas conferences so that we all can share best practices and learn from each other. Yep. Next slide. Now, this is also about capability building, right? Uh, recent year. SNCF enhanced additional level of service. We experience and implement new initiative before advocating co-op in taking up the scheme. By walking the talk, we share about the pain points and best practices to our fellow affiliates. In this way, co-op gain more practical advisors and uh, receive guides to implement scheme we must ease. Yeah. So, so these are some example. Yeah. Okay, next. Other form of support. Okay, I think you know as earlier we talked about platform. You know, not every co-op will be able to have will have the capability or resources to start a platform. But before they start any platform, they can leverage on us and we can help them through our platform, you know, and in offering their services, 
you know, the product and so and so forth. So, so we work closely with them to feature their services, product activities to further cooperators and to general public. So many affiliate find this useful because before they go out and start on their own website and so and so forth, we help them to feature the product and services via our SNCF website. So I think this is one way for the general public, for the members to get to know the new co-op. Yeah, next slide. So certainly I think we are also going to provide more assistance to new entrants and assisting cooperator. Now we have a dedicated team of relationship managers to work with them. So certainly you have any queries or inquiries, uh, please feel free to reach out to them. Just say www.sncf.coop. Just remember that and then someone will respond to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Um, did you also want to share any reflections on what uh, Trevor and Kate has shared or uh, that's all for you? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Justin. Uh, so uh, thanks, uh, Trevor, uh, thanks, Kate. And I thought that I think, you know, uh, in today's, I think any co-op, you need a platform, whether you like it or not. Am I? Because the platform is an easier way to bring you closer to your members and the general public. Unlike in the past, in the old call, without a platform, it takes you years for you to bring your, to engage your members or to reach out to your shoppers or to your customer. But having a platform, it makes things so easy for the call to succeed. So maybe I just want to share the example of, there's a call setup called Mushroom Buddy. You know, this set up by the, uh, the uh, what they call the uh, employment for a person with intellectual disability co-op limited. One of the newly set up in Singapore. And you know, they start growing mushroom in the river container. You know, they, they bought two container and then they start growing mushroom and they employ uh, people with intellectual, intellectual disability to work in that farm. And they start to produce mushroom. The question is that how are they going to sell the mushroom? So what happened is actually they set up a website so that people, members of the public can buy the mushroom. Of course, the quantity is not big. They are producing about 100 kilo a month, but this is a good start for the co-op to engage, you know, and, uh, you know, people with intellectual, in, intellectual disability and certainly also the parents, you know, we get a lot of parents coming forward to help out as well. So that, you know, so this is just one example about using the platform to reach out. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Tung. Um, can I now invite uh, Dr. Hong Ren Yi to share his reflections about what he thinks about platforms and uh, worker co-ops? Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, Kate, Trevor, all, all the organization, organizers who started this, um, this event, really. I mean, I say from the bottom of, of my heart that I am truly thankful because it gave me hope, right? And the hope is in short supply um, today. So it really got me to see a possibility about how work can be innovated to emphasize more worker-centered, worker-first kind of organizations. Um, and, you know, I mean, innovations in work have been happening since forever. Uh, I'm a scholar of work. I have been looking at digital nomadism. I look at co-living, co-working, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, and, you know, those innovations apply to a, usually a very specific group of people, people who are more educated, more wealthy uh, with the resources, right? And very often then you really just cut out those people lower down the value chain, those people who um, are perfectly good workers, right? But then are made to feel desperate, are made to feel replaceable and oftentimes useless, right? Um, and I think then that mentality then reproduces itself and creates all kinds of problems with the rentierism that we see of platforms today, with the exploitation that we see of platforms today. I want to sort of start off by maybe say reflecting on uh, my own work with platforms in Singapore. So I've been doing um, a work with food delivery writers in Singapore who, um, these are delivery writers who are disabled. Um, they are on platforms like Grab and Food Panda. These are the main food delivery platforms in Singapore. Um, and these people with disabilities have both congenital as well as acquired disabilities, sometimes, inter um, sometimes uh, mental disabilities as well, right? In any case, um, they often come into these platforms and this is the first time they actually have a source of reliable income. 
And while doing the work with these people, I, I felt very conflicted. Many times, many of these people tell me that they feel that the platforms have changed their life. And they feel that the platforms have changed their life because this is the first time they can actually make an income. And this is the first time that they can actually give money to their parents and sort of lead what they call a normal life. Um, but if you look at the income, they get very little. If you look at even the conditions of their work, um, a lot of people don't know, but people with disabilities actually encounter a lot more dangers when it comes to doing food delivery, right? Just the basis that they are, um, they are on this mobility scooters, the lower, makes them very much more susceptible to automobile accidents. So in other words, disability breeds disability. Now, what I also found really troubled when I do this project was that I saw how value was extracted from their labor. And one may say that, well, they don't deliver as much. They don't service as many clients. So technically speaking, they are not um, subject to as much rentierism compared to say a normal person, an able-bodied person. However, they have been used as poster childs for the amazing work of platforms in Singapore. And this has gone on to Wall Street. This has created ESG um, value, so on and so forth. Now, as I witnessed that, I realized some of the, that this is a really big issue, right? Uh, and that, that these workers cannot even see the value that they're generating. Uh, and, and I don't mean just financially, socially, people are, you know, having close encounters with food delivery riders who are disabled. They come to see life in a new way. There are social benefits elsewhere as well. So then, you know, a big question for me is how can the model change? Um, and everyone who has asked me, uh, I would say, okay, let's go and let's go and talk to Grab. Or let's go and talk to Food Panda. Let's see what we can advocate from that angle. Co-ops, I think, offer something quite different. Um, but I think it comes with significant challenges that I, I don't want to deny. And maybe I'll just talk about some of the challenges that I think I see later. But the second thing I wanted to say was that um, there was also another problem. So in my broader work on um, platforms, I was looking at a strong reskilling discourse that is going on in Singapore. So, you know, people who are doing platform work are seen to need reskilling, you know, so they're asked to reskill and so on. Um, and if you ask them what they want to learn, I mean, oftentimes they will say, well, teach me how to invest cryptocurrency, All right? Teach me to invest Bitcoin. So Trevor earlier mentioned, you know, when times are hard, when people don't trust markets and governments, they turn to each other. In Singapore, a lot of times it's let's today turn to Bitcoin and they turn to speculative finance. <laughs> this is tremendously problematic. Uh, we are dealing with a system that recapitulates exploitation at every single level. I think that co-ops, having heard especially um, Seed Commons and as well as the, um, the, the, the co-ops that Trevor mentioned, really gives people a chance to get a sense of who they can be. I think that above all is well, the, fundamentally the most important thing that co-ops offer. So um, it is with this that I approach some of the challenges that I immediately see, um, which I mean, the challenges come with potentials as well, but um, it's just something that I've been sort of thinking through and working through. The first thing that I see with the discussion here is that co-ops seem to exist in an ecosystem. They assist with, exist with alliances, with resources from fellow co-ops, with even financial support coming from co-ops as well. Now, uh, in this particular, and the, I think the biggest challenge right now is that, um, at least for the people I spoke to, they are either not aware about this ecosystem or that this ecosystem does not exist enough to give people a sense of their, to empower people to, to be able to achieve something. And I think this relates to a second thing, which is that co-ops are, while well, they are business units, they are fundamentally cultural units. So coming to, from Singapore, where we do not have the kind of history of labor activism, where work, at least as formally un understood as employment is the key modality by which people make sense of their lives. Um, they, they find it really hard to understand what co-ops can do, right? So I, I give an example. So while we were trying to, we we're trying to do an interview with platform workers, and one of the things we we're thinking about is introduce a question about co-ops, right? To ask people, what do you feel, you know, and sort of offer a sort of a trailer and say what you feel if, if this situation 
And the answers they give suggest nonetheless that they see themselves as workers employed. Right? Basically, although they understand that co-ops can help them, you know, the, the key question is, oh, okay, you know, how much more I can get out of it, right? As opposed to this notion that, as well, that they have a say, that they have a right to, they have a way of managing um, the company, all right? Um, and, and so those, I think, are the sort of the deep-seated issues that uh, I think structure the um, system that, that, that we see that, that make co-ops difficult, but also, I think, very promising in Singapore. Um, so from there, I guess, for with related to um, the, the, the questions that, I mean, that with regard to this crowd, right, a nonprofit sector, I guess I have two related questions, okay? The first question lies with, you know, nonprofits, um, especially nonprofits in Singapore, work in a particular way. Most of them, um, their real business model is actually getting money from uh, philanthropy foundations, from uh, you know, government grants, right? In that way, many of these co-ops do not really have the same capacity, I don't have, don't have the same leverage, in other words, right? To an ability to maintain the kind of independence and autonomy uh, within the co-op structure. Like I think Kate mentioned, there were so many questions raised the moment she said that, you know, uh, uh, there, are, there, there are 12 of us, right? So how do you think um, non, uh, sort of nonprofits can deal with this, right? Uh, and yes, I think Trevor mentioned Jack Chu, right? Uh, he's, he's someone really pushing uh, for, for this kind of ideas. And I think that this is, he has the same question, right? So how does, how can we really push um, and maintain autonomy basically, right? Uh, for these co-ops within this particular space. And I guess a separate question would be then, to what extent is, should people be counted as members, right? I think that this is a significant question. Uh, I think when we mention the term democratic, horizontal organizations, there's almost a direct sense that almost everybody is supposed and meant to be counted as a member. But um, are there ways, are there sort of cautions, cautionary tales you might have about how membership should be understood or maybe grown even, right? So I, I mean, I, I feel that the utopian idea of just including everybody can be sometimes um, problematic for the sort of longevity of a co-op and maybe then thinking about expanding slowly might be one possible way. I just uh, thought these are sort of two questions that um, I immediately come up with. Um, oh, actually the third one. The third what the one is based simply with technology. I think um, Trevor mentioned earlier on, right, that you could leverage on, um, you know, things that people have already done, right? How feasible is it? I mean, I, pardon me for being a bit skeptical, right? It seems like you need to be, have a certain amount of technical expertise to leverage on technical expertise. I don't know anything about coding. I will struggle to leverage on expertise in coding, right? So how, how does it, how would it then work, right? So these are sort of the questions that I have. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Radhi. Uh, 